Hey, today I'll be talking about the first book in the series Legend of Zhen Huan. Before we start, some notes on these books. First of all, it's written in first person from Zhen Huan's point of view. That means we only know what she does and will not see any scenes she was not present for. Another important note is that these novels were not initially written about the Emperor Yongzheng of the Qing Dynasty and are actually of a completely fictional Emperor Xuanling, the fourth emperor of the Zhou Dynasty. The story was then adapted to fit the actual history. Well, close enough anyway. Unlike the emperor you know and don't love, this emperor is very young, handsome, and well-liked. And in fact, just age all the characters down about 10 years in your head. Guo has a name change here, Xuan Qing or Prince Qinghe. Everyone else pretty much goes by the same name, so yay for that. Finally, I'm going under the assumption that you've already seen the drama, or at least a recap, so I won't be re-explaining everything and expect a lot of skipping through as I quickly brush over the parts that are exactly the same as they were in the drama. Okay, let's get started. Book 1 starts on the day of the concubine's election, where we meet a 15-year-old Zhen Huan desperate to fly under the radar. She purposely did not wear any especially nice clothes or put on any makeup. The selection was of little importance to me. I was here simply to parade about a bit, fill out the numbers, and then return home. Father always said that his daughter was too pampered to live under the constraints of palace life, that all I needed was to safely marry a good husband and that was all. And mother always said that with my appearance and family background, not to mention my character and learning, she would only find the best husband for me. I've always thought the same. I, Jun Huan, must marry the best man in the world, be joined with him, and grow old together. That is the height of happiness. I can't let myself down so easily. The emperor may rule the world, but he isn't necessarily the best man in my eyes. At the very least, he wouldn't be fully devoted to me. Zhen Huan's thoughts are interrupted when she recognizes Mei Zhuang, they greet each other happily, and then Ling Rong arrives and bumps into Xia Ya Jing, who just like in the drama, blows up at her and demands to know who her father is. He's a nobody, Xia is pissed. Zhen Huan steps in and defends her, does the flower thing, and gives her her earrings, but not totally out of the kindness of her heart. When they're alone, Mei Zhuang asks her why she stuck her neck out. I slowly blew the steam from the lip of the teacup, making sure no one was paying attention to us before responding, I know you worry about me, but think about it. Family background is of course important in the selection process, but virtue, appearance, speech, merit, these things are also indispensable. Xia Yuejing may possess a high status, but based on her conduct, she will never be able to catch the emperor's eye. Even if she is selected, I doubt that things will end well for her, so what does it matter if she's offended? I smiled and said, this is only the first stage. Based on your family background and beauty, you will undoubtedly be selected. Though Miss An is not for much, she is polite and well-mannered. There's a special charm to her. She may have better odds of being chosen than Xia. I'm not interested in entering the palace, but if by chance Miss An is chosen, you will have one more pillar to lean on in the harem. Mei Zhuang goes in, does the whole I'm practically illiterate trick and gets chosen. Zhen Huan's selection is also the same with her accidentally revealing that she's smart and well-spoken. She's asked to raise her head, she's chosen, she's not happy, she goes home. She returns home and we meet her family. She has two little sisters and an older brother named Zhen Hung. He is 19, while Yu Rao and Yu Yao are 7 and 12. Family interactions are all the same, let me bow, I'll always respect you. But when Zhen Huan has that conversation with her father about Huan Bi, it's not a reveal as Zhen Huan has always known, though they've been keeping it a secret from the rest of the family. No idea how or why she knows, it's never mentioned. Zhen Huan promises him to do her best to take care of Huan Bi. Zhen Huan looks into Ling Rong and finds out that she's staying at a cheap inn. She asks her older brother to pick her up and invite her to stay with them, which he does. She's embarrassed at first, but they cheer her up. My brother said with a smile, when I went to the inn just now, the innkeeper was desperate to keep Miss Lingrong there. I ended up having to kick and punch her way out of that place. I pretended at anger. How can you talk about punching and kicking in front of Miss Lingrong? You'll scare her to death. Lingrong's tears turned to laughter and with a shy half smile, she said, that's all right. Thank you for helping me, young master Jen. Her family treats her like their own daughter, even preparing the jewelry and things that she will need to enter the palace. And of course, Lingrong pledges herself to Jen Huan for life. When we do the palace lesson, we learn that the emperor was only 13 when he married the first empress, who was 15 at the time. She died five years later along with her newborn son, and then he married Yi Shou, her fraternal twin sister. One more big change here, the ranks. There are a lot more, as you can see. Just read it like a book. Top left is the most important, down to bottom right, which is the least important. There's really not much else to it story-wise, there are just more ranks. So there's the empress and Hua Fei, and I will hold off on the others for now. And just a reminder, we have seen none of the characterization scenes for any of the characters in the harem because Zhen Huan wasn't there to see them. Zhen Huan becomes Wang Guiren, Mei Zhuang becomes Shen Xiaoyi, and Ling Rong gets An Xuan Shi. Zhen Huan's brother Zhen Heng is planning on joining the army, and one night, she notices he has something on his mind, so she has a chat with him. My brother hesitated for a while and then took out a letter. I knew who had written it the moment the faint herbal fragrance hit my nose. My brother finally spoke. 
When should Chu ask me to bring this to you? I've been thinking about it for two days. I didn't know if I should let you know. I glanced at it lightly and said, he's confused. Are you confused as well? Receiving private correspondence like this is a grave sin for an imperial concubine. His words started to muffle as he said emotionally, I know it's against the rules. It's just his feelings. My voice was cold. I know that I cannot afford them. I saw the guilt on my brother's face and my expression softened. I said gently, brother, do you still not understand me? Brother Shi Chu is not the person in my heart. I have yet to find that person. He nodded slightly. He also knows that there's no going back. He simply wants you to understand his feelings. Shu Chu and I have always gotten along well. I really can't bear to see him suffer this much heartbreak. He paused and then put the letter in my hand. You can handle this letter yourself. She tells him to tell Wen never to bring this up again and he says he will. These two have got a sweet relationship. She made him a robe for his journey to the border and as they talk about him leaving, she reminisces on riding his shoulders when she was younger. Just nice sibling stuff. As for the letter, she's about to burn it, but when she sees it stained with teardrops, she decides to read it. There were only two lines. The moment she joined the powerful family that was as deep as the sea, Xiao Lang became a passerby. The ink was weak and muddled. He must have been incredibly heartbroken as he wrote. I found myself becoming irritated. How could someone be so intent on showering affection on someone who clearly did not reciprocate his feelings? I had no interest in him. How could he possibly claim himself to be my Xiao Lang? I crumpled the letter into a ball and I threw it into the fire. It was immediately swallowed by the flames. The lines Dr. Wen wrote are about a man and woman being separated by a forced marriage to a powerful person. Xiao Lang isn't anyone specific, it's a common title used in Chinese poems as the man the woman is in love with. I used the more literal translation for the letter just now, but if I were to try and make it sound more natural in English, it would be something like, she fell into the new family like falling into the deep sea, and the man she loved became a stranger. And Zhen Huan finds one delusional for thinking this represents the two of them in any way because they were never in love, <laughs> or at least she wasn't. She reminisces on the time he proposed to her, and she thought she made it clear that she was not interested, but he clearly did not get the hint. Speaking of unrequited love, the night before Zhen Huan and Ling Rong are set to leave for the palace, Zhen Huan finds Ling Rong staring at her brother through the window and crying. After watching in silence for some time, Ling Rong left without a word. I couldn't help but feel worried, but then thinking it over, I thought that based on what had just transpired, my brother was probably unaware of Ling Rong's feelings for him. At most, it was only Ling Rong's unrequited pining, but I still felt a need to caution her. It wasn't easy for her to enter the palace. She couldn't lose all of her future prospects because of this. They enter the palace. Junhuan isn't highly ranked enough to have her own place, but she becomes the de facto leader of the palace she's in because there doesn't happen to be a proper mistress living there at the time. Living there are Shi Meiren, who arrived three years ago, and Chun Changzai, who arrived four days ago. They get along well enough, get some presents, and are ordered to meet the empress. We are introduced to Duan Fei, Che Fei, Li Guipin, and Cao Ronghua. Che is First Prince's mother, and just as in the drama, he's not very well liked and neither is she, which is why Hua and Duan still outrank her, even though he is the only prince. If you're wondering about him being called First Prince, it seems princes who don't make it past a certain age are not recorded, so though they both existed, both Chun Yuan and Yi Shou's sons are practically wiped away. There are two princesses, the first the daughter of Xin Guipin, and the second is Wen Yi, Cao's daughter. Hua Fei is as cocky as expected, this little confrontation is word for word. They go outside and again, this confrontation is pretty much word for word, including Hua Fei deciding to punish her with Yi Zhang Hong, beating her legs until the ground is bright red. It's terrifying and Zhen Huan asks Dr. Wen to make her sick. Since she's so ill, Chun and Shi are moved out to give her space to recuperate. Everyone starts writing her off, servants become ruder and ruder, her eunuchs leave to be with Li, time passes, New Year's Day she goes out to hang her portrait, gets caught, pretends to be a maid, and runs off. Yu takes the credit and becomes favored. Zhen Huan is swinging one day when she's approached by a man claiming to be Prince Qinghe or Xuan Qing. They chat, she plays music, he loves it, they plan to meet again. One night, the trio are playing a game where you pull out lines of poetry from a cup filled with strips of paper or sticks, kind of like fortune cookies or horoscopes. It's fun to see if they really reveal something about you. Ling Rong pulls one out that says that there is a tenderness in her heart for someone, but she's unable to express it. I suddenly recall Ling Rong's cries on the night before we entered the palace. They seem to ring in my ears. I felt a chill in my heart, though I kept the smile on my face. Pretending at a casual air, I said to Mei Zhuang, Naturally, the tenderness is for the emperor. Could it be for anyone else? We are all imperial concubines, so of course there's no one other than the emperor in our hearts. Though I was facing Mei Zhuang, I watched Ling Rong's expression from the corner of my eye. When she heard those words, she lost her composure for a brief moment. Her gaze quickly swept over me, and then she smiled brightly and said, I'm still young. How can I understand this tenderness my two sisters speak of? I smiled and said nothing. 
I had already said what I needed to. Ling Rong should naturally have been able to understand. Jin Huan goes to meet Prince Qing He in the rain, he doesn't show. Later, there's that swing confrontation with you, complete with the emperor showing up, demoting you to Gong Yi and promoting Jin Huan to Pian. Oh my gosh, you're the emperor. Yep, sorry I lied. He carries her, promises to take better care of her from now on. Jun Huan has mixed thoughts. Obviously, she never intended to be with the emperor and is very much aware that he can never love anyone wholeheartedly, but you know, he's young, handsome, amazingly attentive to her, and lest you forget, she's 16. She decides it is what it is and she will go along with it and see where the road takes her. She asks one to help her recover. Lots of flirting, they sleep together for the first time. There's all that talk of I see you as my husband, not just my emperor. Jun Huan becomes the new it girl. Lu Hai tries to come back and gets caught by Li. Hua starts getting jealous and asks Mei Zhuang in to copy scriptures, except we don't actually see what happened at all because Jun Huan was not there. We just get the news that Mei Zhuang fell into the water. Word for word, beat for beat, then Mei Zhuang wakes up and wants revenge. Jun Huan starts becoming lethargic. Oh no, it's poison. They figure out it was the maid. Although, I remember having a problem with this scene because it boiled down to hurt yourself if you're really loyal. I don't want to hurt myself. So you betrayed me. But in the book, it's even more ridiculous because she does grab the hot coal and then confesses. Why? She grabs the coal, burns the shit out of her hand, and then screams, throws it away, and admits she did it. Like, girl, if you were gonna confess anyway, why not be guilty with an unburnt hand? Anyway, they catch the culprit, Yu was behind it, the emperor wants her locked up, Jun Huan accidentally, not accidentally, reveals that she was the one in the garden, so Yu is to be put to death. Okay, then, in the novel, it's Jun Huan who goes to see Yu and orders the guards to kill her. I think this was much better done in the drama, actually, because novel Jun Huan really has no motivation to kill her except a bit of revenge, and she gains zero from her death, especially considering the empress and Hua could have found out and punished her for overstepping her bounds. Ling Rong doing it to try and get some footing in this trio made a lot more sense, and later, her getting her feelings hurt from overhearing the reactions worked really well for her character development, in my opinion. Okay, then Yu's ghost starts flying about, Jun Huan has a few nightmares, and she's pretty funny even when she's scared. Thinking she's seen a ghost one night, she grabs a pillow and throws it at the specter, shouting, It was I, Jun Huan, who ordered you to be strangled. If I hadn't killed you, you would certainly have killed me. If you dare linger about my palace again, I will have your bones crushed into ash so you can't even keep your disgusting corpse. Cute. Jun Huan, Mei Zhuang, and Shi, Jun Huan's old roommate, work to spread rumors and make Li scared. We have that epic confrontation where Li finally loses it, Hua tries to take her away, and is foiled by Jun Huan. In the book, Li actually is heard by the emperor and the empress, and then sent to the cold palace for something she must have confessed to. It's clearly something related to Hua, but the emperor doesn't confront Hua directly, instead hosting a meeting where he lets everyone know that the empress will be taking over all harem responsibilities again, and pointedly telling Hua to step back. Jin Huan can see that Hua's eyes are red, but she won't allow herself to cry in front of the other women. They move palaces for the summer. We get to know Cao better. She does that whole pot stirring thing of, hmm, when did you fall for the emperor, Jin Huan, when you thought he was the prince? Jin Huan has to declare her love, but then as she's leaving, we see that she's actually pretty pissed at the emperor for being so ridiculous. Han Bi followed me back to the palace. Seeing that I was unhappy, she said cautiously, Mistress, don't be sad. The emperor loves you very much. A cold sneer appeared at the corner of my mouth. Does the emperor really love and respect me? If he really loved me, how could he listen to Cao Qin Mo's slander and doubt me so much? She goes on to say that all of this is just a game of keep the emperor's fragile ego sated, and as young as she is, she knows how to play the game well. Mei Zhuang starts taking prescriptions from that sketchy doctor, Cao gets promoted to Jie Yu, Mei Zhuang is promoted to Ronghua after she's found to be pregnant, then Wen Yi's birthday bash, Duan shows up for the first time and has that weird reaction to seeing Jin Huan, of course we don't know why. Jin Huan goes out for air, fall, feet, Xuan Qing being a pervert, what's your name, bye. She comes back, Cao has that totally spontaneous idea for them to showcase their talents, Jin Huan gets the swan dance, Xuan Qing comes in with his blistering flute solo, then Mei Zhuang starts to feel nauseous and can't keep playing. Xuan Qing throws his flute at Jin Huan and then heads over to Mei Zhuang's instrument to keep playing. Jin Huan hesitates for a moment and then proceeds to keep dancing while playing the flute. And then the emperor gets a flute and joins her. It's quite a show and there's the added benefit that no one can compare this performance to the previous empresses. The emperor is smitten anew and Jin Huan is promoted to Jiayu. So many ranks. Hua comes out with her poem and is forgiven. Tao pats herself on the back. Jin Huan gets the nickname Huan Huan, which is totally not a reference to anyone else. There's the whole Mei Zhuang was faking her pregnancy thing, and for a moment, Jin Huan actually suspects her of faking this whole thing for attention. But the evidence points to Mei Zhuang being set up. She's locked away and demoted to Chang Zai. Jin Huan finds out that her father has decided it's time for her brother to get married. Ling Rong has been making an effort not to be noticed by the emperor. She's clearly still hung up on Jin Hung, and Jin Huan wants her to get over him. 
I couldn't help but feel some hesitation. I knew that Lingrong was the only person I could trust and use as a support, but after nearly a year in the palace, it seemed she still had lingering feelings for my brother. Not only did she avoid seeing the emperor, she also went out of her way to not attract his attention whenever she did happen across him. How could I have the heart to force her into a relationship with a man she did not want? Zhen Huan visits Lingrong and finds that at this point, even her maids, who are 12 to 13, don't respect her. Jin Huan confronts Ling Rong, saying she knows that during their performance earlier, Ling Rong was purposely not singing as well as she does when they're alone. Ling Rong won't admit to anything, so Jin Huan brings up the letter she got from her brother. I sigh deeply in my heart. Ling Rong, don't blame me for being cruel. The care you have for my brother will do your life no good. I harden my heart, putting a bright smile on my face. Father said that when brother comes home this time, he'll be choosing a wife for him. Our family will finally have an elder sister that can take care of things in the house. It's such a joyous event for us. Ling Rong swayed slightly when she heard the words, and the light in her eyes dimmed instantly like a red-hot charcoal quenched with water, going out in a wisp of smoke and a soft hiss. With that, she confirms Ling Rong's feelings and snaps that thread in one fell swoop, hopefully. Ling Rong composes herself and says her congratulations. With that, Jin Huan starts pushing her more and more towards the emperor, and it seems Ling Rong is willing to go for it. The book ends with this line, I wouldn't bring it up again. We had already reached this point, more words would be of no use. The choice was up to her. I had done all I could. So, thoughts. I'm generally not a fan of books written in first person. I mean, it works sometimes, of course, but for a harem drama, it seems like a big mistake because we can only see things from Jun Huan's point of view. There's a whole world of characters we're missing out on. Scenes like Kwa Fei being an absolute menace, the Emperor and Guo Wang's super awkward relationship, conversations princes have with their mothers, etc., etc. I mean, we're never going to see anyone's private conversations with their maids. That's like bread and butter for a harem drama. But though it can be a bit stiff sometimes, only seeing things through one character's eyes, it's nice to get some insight on Jun Huan. Since we can hear Jun Huan's thoughts all the time, we learn that she did not come into this some sweet, innocent little girl. From the way she helped Ling Rong only to help Mei Zhuang, to the contempt she has for Wen's feelings, and how well she understands that the Emperor's feelings are not totally sincere, she's very jaded right off the bat. Also, all of the best lines from the show came directly from the book. I don't mean to complain too much. Liu Lianzi is a great storyteller, and of course, there would be no Jun Huan Zhan without her. It's fun seeing the things that were cut out as well. I love Ling Rong's background story here. I can understand why it was cut, but it does flow nicely with the story, and it makes sense that a young girl meeting probably the first handsome young man who's ever been nice to her would immediately think herself in love. But overall, with all the additions they had to make by filling in the scenes where Jen Huan's not present, it's a fine thing to cut, I think. In fact, and this doesn't happen often, but so far I much prefer the drama to the novel. They were 100% faithful for all the great scenes, but the changes they made were perfect. I would say especially with aging the characters up and not making them as hot as they seem to be in the book. The characters being in their 20s makes the world feel less lived in by the time Jin Huan gets there, which is one of the things I love most about this drama, that they were all grown adults who had been at this for decades, and then naive Jin Huan enters and is thrown into the fire. But like the emperor especially, I mean, he's a hot 25 year old, kind of removes a lot of the uncomfortableness of the actual situation and gives it more of a fanfic or fantasy feel. And also it makes it a lot less believable that he would be so insecure and jealous of his 18 year old brother. It was also important to the story, I felt, that the women were getting older and naturally felt threatened by the newer, younger girls. It made the unprovoked jealousy and attacks a lot more believable. Final note that's kind of funny, the book is a lot more crass. Chapter 23 has Mei Zhuang giving Jun Huan tips on tales she's heard of how to ensure pregnancy after sex, and chapter 26 is just a straight up midday sex scene, and maybe it's a non-native speaker thing, but I found it very cringe. That's it for now, till next time, thanks for watching.